We actually found a genetic diagnosis in like 23% of these patients. Fellow Homo sapiens, did you know that the lives of adults with epilepsy, well, they are as valuable and as important as those of children with epilepsy, even if we aren't as cute? Well, today we have the marvellous upcoming clinical geneticist, Katrine Johannesson from the Danish Epilepsy Centre, who should be explaining to us the value of genetic testing on adults with epilepsy. If epilepsy research and improving the lives of people with epilepsy is of interest to you, make sure that you press subscribe or the follow button and hit that bell to receive notifications of our weekly episodes. Thank you, Tori. So happy to be here. So I'm a medical doctor from Denmark. I became interested in epilepsy genetics, especially adults, when I recently finished uh, my PhD and also a little bit of uh, postdoc work at the Danish Epilepsy Center. Um, and we recently did this uh, very exciting study on uh, genetic testing in adults with epilepsy. Give us a little bit of the intro of how you got into this and why are you doing, or why are you studying adults and genetic testing um, regarding the epilepsies? Because we're not very cute, right, as adults. So what got you into that? <laughs> yeah, so so of course we also see a lot of the, the pediatric patients at the Danish Epilepsy Center, but we also have like an equally um, department for adult patients. And of course, we did a lot of studies on the pediatric patients. Those are usually the ones where parents like push for genetic testing. Um, but um, within the recent years, I think that also the neurologists at our adult department became aware of genetic testing. And they have actually been very good at referring some of their adult patients uh, to us to do genetic testing. Um, so uh, we did, of course, this testing for a couple of years, and then we thought, well, let's look at it. Let's see if does this matter to these patients. Uh, what do we find? Um, yeah, that sort of thing. What 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 are the benefits for doing genetic testing for some adult patients? So we actually found a genetic diagnosis in like twenty three percent of these patients. Whoa, nearly nearly a quarter then even though it might seem like, okay, so you have a genetic diagnosis. For some of these patients and some of these families, it really does matter. Uh, we've had like mothers of adult patients, like a mother to a 35 year old, like believing for the last 35 years of her life that uh, this was her fault, that she somehow inflicted this epilepsy in her child. Um, and then we did genetic testing and found that uh, the patient had an SCN1A variant. SCN1A is a very well-known cause of epilepsy and causes Dravet syndrome. Um, and so we could like take away this guilt uh, from this mother. Uh, so actually it had a very significant impact in this family. And we had several of these families where giving them a genetic diagnosis actually mattered a lot. What, and what difference might it make to the patient, the adult patient? We had different, like different genetic uh, diagnoses. Some of them, or the majority, were SCN1A patients, Dravet cases, um, where they had actually been on sodium channel blockers for many years. Which aren't necessarily great, right, for this epilepsy, it can make it worse. Yeah, if you have an SCN1A variant, we know this very well. From the children, there are also studies that shows that if you are treated with sodium channel blockers, your, um, your cognitive skills, your IQ will be lower than if you're not. Um, so, so we got back to the treating physicians and were able to taper them off these drugs. Um, and they actually improved. Of course, these, these were patients that had lived a long time with their epilepsy, so it wasn't like a miracle, um, but they became seizure-free. Wow. And usually, like, the place where they were living um, got back to us and told us that actually they saw a, an improvement also in the awareness and in, like, the general mood of the patient. Uh, so it mattered a lot. Yeah, it's not just, oh, let's have a test. It's not like doing some sort of, you know, oh, checking out the history of one's ancestors or something. Isn't that cool? This is something that... No, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I bet that had a really positive impact, which you implied earlier um, regarding the mum of a certain case, but a really positive impact on the carers and family, um, seeing their loved one in a better state of health. Yeah, even this, this uh, like, 50-year-old man who lived in a 
like a institution of some sort uh, where his carers was like, well, for the past couple of years, he had been like deteriorating, not really interacting, like something was going on. And then he was taken off these uh, drugs that were obviously not good for him. And, and yeah, they reported that all of a sudden he was like his old self. And yeah, uh, so that's that's really nice when the stuff you do actually also matters in real life. <laughs> well, yeah. And I bet heaps of people, um, if we've got people um, with epilepsy watching on listening, lo lots of us will identify with often the negative cognitive impacts of drugs. Imagine if you could come off those. Exactly. And the impact that would have to your life. Yeah. Is this whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing we're talking about? This was over a period of, uh, of a couple of years. So it started as um, like gene panels. Right. With only like a few genes and then it evolved. And these days it's mainly based on exome. Mm -hmm. I guess it will be different from from country to country. Um, in Denmark, I think uh, the majority of uh, genetic diagnostics today is done on exome, and gradually we will probably transition to genome analysis. More and more when it becomes cheaper and quicker. And yeah, so. exactly, exactly. I know lots of people affected by the epilepsies, um, patients and families might say, whoa, okay, I've got refractory epilepsy. Okay, I should have this whole exome sequencing. Can you tell us what sort of people should and what sort of people might not benefit or might not be seen as prior a priority? Of course, we looked at like the the history of these patients and when their epilepsy began and stuff like this. Um, and definitely uh, the ones where we actually found a genetic diagnosis, so they had very early onset of their epilepsy. So that would be like within the first couple of years of life. Um, and they also have cognitive impairment of some sort uh, that also makes the diagnostic yield higher. And of course the refractory epilepsy as well. Um, but definitely this, this early onset epilepsy that should give you a hint of the fact that it might be genetic uh, in some way, maybe in, <laughs> In the future, uh, there will be like other other things that we can look for. But right now, we look for these monogenic causes of epilepsy, and that's usually seen in the very severe, very early onset epilepsies. But maybe in the future, we will also be able to look at um, like polygenic risk scores in epilepsy, and that will of course open to a, a much wider. Um, population of patients. From uh, other people I've had the privilege to speak to in, in the same sphere as um, you, Katrine, we're looking at, I understand, a really huge percentage of um, patients, adult and children actually, there is a genetic factor in their epilepsy. Is that what you've discovered? I mean, I know that you said that in the whole exome sequencing, the whole exome sequencing that you've been doing, 23% of people were identified as having a genetic epilepsy, but do you foresee in the future that number could be higher once you look outside that particular exome? Yeah, of course, if, if we start looking at whole genome, it might increase a little bit, but I, I still think that it, it depends a lot on uh, like who you are testing uh, when looking for these monogenic causes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so of course at the epilepsy center, we have a very specialized, uh, like a subgroup of, of people with epilepsy. Uh, we like to say that it's like the top 10 of the, the people with epilepsy in Denmark, like the, the worst <laughs> top 10. So maybe the bottom yeah. 10. <laughs> top 10. Yeah. They might think bottom 10, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so of course it's very, it's a, yeah, it's a selected group of, of patients that we did this in. Well, I would say to people listening, look, this is really exciting stuff, um, but just, you know, don't expect a, uh, a genetic diagnosis for everybody tomorrow. Cause that's not going to happen. No, but if, but if you are caring for, uh, an adult patient and, 
And you think that like this could sound genetic, then maybe you should consider doing the genetic testing because it could have an impact on the patient's life, actually. So just so everybody knows, um, Katrina and I, well, we actually we met on Twitter over lockdown, <laughs> but then we met face to face for the first time at the DICE conference. Um, well, I was going to say in Copenhagen, it's a little bit outside of the city, wasn't it? Your presentation was fab. I actually understood quite a, a large portion of it, so I was, I was quite happy about that. Um, so good presenter, because lots of the time it's just like loads of acronyms that nobody knows about unless you know, they read a flipping thesaurus every day. So um, <laughs> could you just give everybody like a brief sort of oversight of your presentation on that day? Yeah, so my, my presentation was on uh, genetic testing in adults with epilepsy. Like uh, I tried to do it like so that everybody would understand because, of course, there is a, lo a lot of people there listening. Um, so I like did it in three parts, like uh, what do we find when we do the uh, genetic testing in adults with epilepsy? So it's mainly SCN1A, Dravid, uh, so far, but also other things. Um, and, and what like the differences between what we find when we test adults compared to children mm. um, and where some of the differences might be in the, in the genes. And then I uh, like, did a, a section on like uh, who we should test, like uh, test those adults that had early onset, that had a severe epilepsy, refractory epilepsy, that have cognitive impairment, some other things than, than just epilepsy. Um, and then of course the why should we do it? Uh, and that would be because of course it matters for the patient. There is actually some cases where we might do something like in the treatment or uh, other things, and um, but also because like in the in the pediatric population there is a huge need to know what happens when you grow up. Right. Yes. The paper that this talk originated from got a lot of attention in some of the in some of the like patient groups on specific genes because. They all want to know what's going to happen to my child when he is 30. Um, yeah, so, so that's actually a huge need for, for like knowing where these adults are and how they're doing in their adult life. And the impacts, I think, of certain treatments exactly. that they might have when they're younger. How does that impact them later on in life, cognitively? Um, in, in terms of their mental health and of course you know their seizures and epilepsy and, and you know all the stuff that goes with it yeah so that's that's yeah really important yeah well thank you so much for joining us today Katrina. this is uh, absolutely brilliant i'm so um happy that we finally got to have you with us me too i will certainly keep track of your work everybody check down below in the text for links to katrine she's um, on social media um, and if you want to check out the papers um, mentioned then i will have links to those too thank you so much katrine